right. Well, welcome to This Week in Hearing. I'm Shari Eberts, author, along with Gail Hannon, of Here and Beyond, Live Skillfully with Hearing Loss. And I'll be your host for this episode. Today, we have a terrific guest and one I am very excited to talk with, Lou Ferrigno. Lou Ferrigno is a fitness icon, motivational speaker, and co-founder of Ferrigno Fit, but he's probably best known for his portrayal of the Incredible Hulk in the 1970s and 80s. Like every good comic book hero, Lou's origin story begins in the face of adversity. As an infant, Lou suffered a series of ear infections and lost 80% of his hearing, although he didn't really get diagnosed fully until he was three years old. This circumstance led to bullying both in school and at home. And in 2021, he received a cochlear implant and his life changed. The world of communication opened up for him, and he's now dedicating himself to helping others understand the benefits of this modern miracle. So thank you, Lou, for being here to talk about that experience and to share what you've learned with other people with hearing loss. You're welcome. That was a wonderful speech. Well, uh, let's start off with talking about your hearing loss and its impact on your early childhood. Maybe you can share some of your earliest memories of your hearing loss. Well, at the age of about three or four, uh, my parents would clap their hand. My parents would clap their hand. I have a response that they took me to a ear, nose, and throat doctor. I was diagnosed with a hearing loss. You just mentioned like 80 85%. But back in those days, the hearing aid they had with the old-fashioned hearing aid, they gave me uh, the hearing aid strapped to the chest, and then you have the wire with the, with the button sticking out of the ear, the old-fashioned hearing aid. So it made me feel like a Martian. You know, I felt like a freak, uh, and very noticeable. And you know, children do not have the psychological defenses to defend themselves. So I was kind of ridiculed when I was in school because uh, the fact that I was more like an outcast. And it made me look kind of like a very introverted person because at the same time I had a severe speech impediment. So I had to grow up, grow up with that. But what's funny is that to escape that pain, I used to read a lot of comic books, like the Superman, all comic books, because I was obsessed with power. At the time, I realized the power thing that gave me the, the self-confidence I needed because, uh, you know, living with a rejection, not able to hear well and able to uh, conduct myself in a, in a good speech pattern. So that's how I grew up. I'm very introverted. And I, and, you know, back then in the 50s, it wasn't as popular as now because people did not understand what a really hearing aid was because now we have the BTE. But in those days, I mean, it was just obvious. Sometimes kids would just punch me in the chest just to be mean to break a hearing aid. And I would go home and I would tell my father about it. My father would give me a beating. He said, don't come home if you can't fight your own battle. So I, I, I grew up in a tough neighborhood. So that's what I had to deal with at the time. Wow, that does sound really tough, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, I had hearing loss. Mine didn't start until my mid-20s. And I dealt just a lot with hearing loss stigma when I first developed it, trying to hide it. I mean, did you battle stigma in any way? Or was it just something that you had to accept? No, I do have to battle. But I had to work harder than the average person to see because, uh, you know, nobody could have pat me on the back. So I didn't want to feel sorry for myself. I got to a point that I wanted to function like everybody else. Because a long time ago, when I was in the fifth grade, it, um, the teacher was talking to my father, said, listen, they should put me in, in the public school because the parochial school at the time was too difficult for me. So I remember that I would play in parochial school. And then the teacher would talk to me. I would turn around and look like the kids behind me. And because I thought the teacher was talking to, to, to the kids behind me. So anyway, again, they called my father. They said they should put me in the school for the deaf. And I'm not deaf at the time. So what happened, I, I ended up being taken back to the parochial school. And then I, I had to be requested, be told I had to sit in the first row in the class because this way I would be able to hear the teacher because at the time, I didn't want to tell anybody I had a hearing loss. I pretend I heard everything. And the difficult thing for me there was the teacher faced the blackboard to, uh, to, to, conduct, to conduct the class, I would never blow up the information. That's why I, I would always, I would never score uh, high on the examination. So, I, but then eventually, when I was in the first row, that helped me tremendously because I made more people aware that I had a hearing problem. So it was okay because back then, when you try to hide from it, like you said, it, you end up shooting yourself in the foot. A hundred percent. It's so important to be upfront about it, but it's so hard for people to, I guess, overcome that barrier, usually with themselves, really. Correct. 
So uh, talk a little bit about your hearing loss and how it impacted your career. You obviously had a very successful bodybuilding career and also as an actor, but how did your hearing loss play into that? Well, like I said before, I did all these different comics. And I remember one time I went to a comic book store to trade comic books for other comic books. And I saw a magazine that said Muscle Power. There's a blonde-haired guy named Dave Drake was on the cover. It said Mr. America, Mr. Universe. And I, I always used to watch when I was young, like the Mr. American patch and on TV, because I used to love all the girls come on stage. That's what they do, the interview and the presentation. That was scary for me because, you know, I had a difficult time speaking. So when I discovered uh, bodybuilding, and I realized that I wanted to work out with weights because I know it gave me self-admiration, self-respect, because I knew there was a connection for me. So that gave me a lot of self-confidence because I learned to work on my body. And at the same time, you know, dealing with the hearing issue, I, at the time, my father, I had what you call I, one hearing aid at the time. My father didn't want to buy two, didn't want to buy two hearing aids. So what happened, though, I was told to wear a hearing aid six months the right ear, six months to the left ear, and then switch. If I haven't done that, I would not be able to wear two hearing aids like over the years. So I basically, you, you didn't want to spend the extra money. So I just, I just had to just label with the one hearing aid I had to understand conversation. It was kind of tough because, uh, you know, when you go to the gym to work out, I had to take the hearing aid out because it wasn't used, able to handle the preparation. So most of the time I was like in, in a very silent death world. But the thing is that growing up, Reading these different magazines gave me the ability that I found out is my passion. Every one of us had the passion. So for me, that was my passion. I embraced that passion because I knew that was my way to survive. If I haven't gone in different directions, I won't be here today because other people, my situation probably resort to drugs, alcohol, because they want to just uh, get that full sense of security. But for me, I, I, I didn't want to feel sorry for myself because when I was born, I didn't have perfect hearing. So my father rejected me because I was not the perfect son. So I had to carry his pain. But at the same time, I became what you call, I would say, like a warrior. I just had to fight harder than the average person to succeed. I didn't want to get left back in school. And I had to do what I had to do to take to pass my pass my examination to succeed and, and, uh, and find some kind of a career for myself. But growing up back in those days, it was kind of rough because you had to deal with a lot of uh, the abuse. And then, uh, and then uh, people would say, to me, I could never have a steady job because you have to have perfect hearing. Maybe you could drive a taxi cab someday. I didn't want to hear all these uh, comments because I felt better than that because my father was a police officer. And I knew when I was that young, I could not be a police officer because of my hearing situation. So I had to resort to different things. Good for you for having that internal strength and that stamina. It's, it's very challenging. And like you said, some people can sort of get off on the wrong direction and you were able to find something to really exert energy against and had success and that's that's tremendous so uh, how, what was that like to you know have one hearing aid in one ear for half the time i mean you because you really hear with your brain right not necessarily with your ears so i can't imagine what your brain was going through in terms of trying to process the sound from you know a new side of your head every six months do you remember having that be a challenge for you yeah, because I remember at the time my left ear was worse than the right ear because my left ear is a, a 115 decibels loss. My right ear is 110. So it was hard for me to talk over the phone with the left ear because most of the time I like to talk over the phone with the right hearing aid. But it was interesting, when I moved to California when I was 26, the best thing I did for myself, I bought two hearing aids. I said, I'm going to try to wear two hearing aids because I can hear better because I was able to afford it. So I bought two hearing aids that helped me... Uh, a lot of taking me to the second level. But growing up switching hearing aids, I kind of resented because the fact that one was better than the other. But I was told at the time I should be doing that because if I don't, if I haven't done it, then just wear just one hearing aid, then later in life, I, the left ear would always reject any kind of hearing aid, anything. So at least I was able to do that. That's why the implant works for me because if I haven't worn the hearing aid in the left ear all my whole life, it could have been a kind of a negative. Well, that's really interesting. I guess it kept the nerve connections working. So, exactly. right. No, oh, that's great. So you've said, I've heard you say before that you used to hide your hearing loss when you were going for acting jobs. You were worried maybe that would prevent you from getting the acting jobs. But what made you decide to sort of be more public about your hearing loss now? Well, when I first began doing the Hulk series, I never talked about my hearing loss. 
So anytime I did interview, people would think I was drunk because I never talked about the hearing loss because my speech wasn't the way I speak now. So I just started how to come out openly and talk about it because hiding it, I was only cheating myself. But I was, I was amazed to receive so many different compliments that people respected me for it because my father, when I was raised, always told me that because you have a hearing loss, a hearing aid, he would call me a misfit, he would call me deaf mute, and he was a very abusive father. So that, that, that gives, gives, gave me a lot of different scars. So if I had to put the clock back, if I talk openly about it, I think it would have been much different than I expected it was back then. But the thing is that once I was able to talk to the public open about my hearing loss, and they kind of accepted it because accepted it because when I did the Hulk series, it was a non-speaking part. But I figured it was a platform for me because a lot of people related to the fact that I was doing the Hulk because I couldn't speak, I couldn't hear. But I did it because it was a great training platform for me. And funny, since then, I've done over 45 film and five TV series. But there are now in Hollywood, now Hollywood has accepted diversity, especially when it comes to uh, handicap. Uh, yeah, physically, emotionally, or it has to do with race. But in my time, when I started in the 70s, uh, a lot of agents would say to me, I can't handle it because you have a speech impediment. And how are you going to hear the director for like taking direction, stuff like that? So I never gave up. I just kept pursuing, I kept fighting, kept fighting because um, I just knew someday that I'm going to find the light at the end of the tunnel. Good for you. I love that attitude. It's, it's really inspiring, I'm sure, for a lot of people that are struggling with different things as well. So uh, what made you decide to move forward with a cochlear implant, right? So you used hearing aids for your whole life. What, what was sort of the impetus to try something different? Well, I knew because when I wore hearing aids, it had a lot to do with volume, and I was able to hear different sounds, different noises at a, at a high volume level, but it was hard to... Uh, as a, as a way to differentiate the sound of my own speech or hearing other pe people speaking, because sometimes some words would rhyme with each other. So a friend of mine, he lost his hearing. He had a perfect hearing before. He did a lot of research and he decided to have a cochlear implant. So I saw the impact it had had on him, how much it changed his life. He was able to hear almost like he heard before, it's almost like perfect hearing. That gave me the incentive to, to do it because my right hearing right now, I'm starting to lose my natural hearing because I'm 70 years old. But I want to feel like to the point that I have to isolate myself again and just live with just with hearing aids. But I thought like this would give me hope. That's why I decided to take the chance to have the implant because I just knew from, from the friend of mine who explained to me, he said how much of that it changed him. I'm glad I did it, did it because of course I was nervous before I had the surgery. You know, your biggest fear is that am I ever going to hear again because anything could happen. But the thing is that, um, it was a life change of experience for me because it helped me to appreciate hearing the sound I never heard before, and especially in conversation, especially in my own uh, articulation when I talk to people. Yeah, it probably helped you hear your own, your own voice, like you said, right? So Huge. It's, yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. So is there a special sound that you were able to hear with the cochlear implants that you had never heard before? Was there some like surprising sound to you that um, that was opened up to you because of the cochlear implants? Probably a lot of the different machines in the house, like for example, like the air conditioner refrigerator. <laughs> yeah, like for example, I could hear my phone texting 100 feet away. Like one day I said to my wife, I, I was 50 feet away, and I said to my wife, I'm taking the hearing aid out. This was, with the, this was the beginning stage when I had the implant. And I said, just talk very low, whisper something. I was able to hear what she had to say that's 50 feet away. Wow. Yeah, it's huge. Because with the hearing aid, it's a volume, but you don't get the clarity. The biggest word I'm looking for is, is the clarity. That's huge because the best hearing aid in the world is not going to give you the clarity like the cochlear implant does. Right, that's terrific. So uh, cochlear implants have been a little bit more prominent, I think, in the mainstream media in the past few years, which is great, right? People are starting to know what a cochlear implant is. Um, but some of, at least in my opinion, and some of this media coverage has been a little inaccurate. You know, for example, in Sound of Metal, the popular movie from last year, I don't know if you have any thoughts on the way that cochlear implants are portrayed in the media. Well, I was very disappointed because when I, when I saw that film, they had the guy, he had his head shaved, and you could see a huge uh, scar. It looked like, like a, a Frankenstein kind of surgery. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of um, 
I think that could change in the film, especially when he lost his hearing and he's still having a conversation. And even though he's completely deaf, a deaf person, when you have no hearing, you have to rely more on reading lips, and especially, you know, a lunch year to activate the speech. But then once he had the implant, the end part, but I think that if I was involved directing that movie, I would have given a different approach. But I, I think it, 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 it gathered a lot of negativity with people. Where people get the impression that it's a major surgery, but it's only a minimal surgery. Mm-hmm. So I think that's why now um, what, what we're doing now with cochlear to raise the awareness of the people understand that what I've been through, what, I talk, what I've gone through when I talk about it, it's not as dramatic as, uh, as you know, as uh, dangerous you, th- you think it could be. It's really a minimum surgery. And it's the fact that, you know, there's no pain to it. It's only an incision they make. It's not, a, not, you're not cutting over the head. It's just putting the implant under the skin. I mean, and, and, and the implant is so small. But the amazing thing is that I, I wear what you call the cancel on the outside. And over the years, I noticed that had the, it's, it's smaller in size because 20 years ago, I would just see people wear like the can stove with like the size of a hockey puck. Hmm. But what's interesting that when I talked to these people in person, they were able to conduct a conversation. They were able to hear better than I was hearing at the time with the hearing aids. And that's it. I said to myself, this is amazing because, you know, if, if, if these people were deaf before and they're hearing better than I've, I've been hearing, then, uh, then that's, not, that's something I should be thinking about. Yeah, it really is sort of a miracle technology, right? I mean, it, it's like off and on. You know, my friends who have cochlear implants, they say, I take it off, I'm totally deaf, I put it on, and it's like a miracle that, you know, you can hear the world just sort of opens up. So it's very exciting. But the good thing is, I don't think you have to worry about losing any of your hearing with the cochlear implant because it has to do with the, uh, the brain waves and the brain connection because a hearing aid, you see, I think because my whole life I depended so much on volume, I think that was very detrimental to my he- natural hearing. Mm. And I think that that affected my hearing because the hearing aid I'm wearing now, they put two receivers in because I just need that power, the volume. But you know, once you have so much volume, you sacrifice clarity. Right. So do you think about getting another cochlear implant? Is that something yeah. you, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so that's a yes or you're thinking yeah, about it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Very exciting. Yeah. They could, uh, uh, the much of the life changing for me, could you imagine with two? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you recently met with um, some people at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and you were trying to really urge them to make cochlear implants more available for aging adults who might benefit from that. What was your discussion with them like? Is there something you want to share about about that with the, our viewers? No, especially when you get older, if you're covered by Medicare, Medicare covers the surgery because, you know, uh, instead of spending thirty, forty thousand dollars if you have Medicare, at least they provide that. And they, that's this way you feel like that's 50 50 percent of the battle. Like considering it's not the money situation you have to do with the situation that you could be a candidate and you can get a cochlear implant and can help you with Medicare because without Medicare, then some people just can't afford it. Right. And so what was their reaction? Did they seem amenable yeah. to the idea? Yeah. There, with, over the past year, I've done a lot of different speaking, different convention. A lot of people came up to me and complimented, complimented me on it and telling me how many people they know that they want to get a cochlear implant and they see what happened to me, they feel like it's not a, it's not going to be a bigger challenge as a challenge they expected. So they gave them the incentive, why not? Luke done it, I can do the same thing because it much would help me, especially when having a profound hearing loss because a lot of people before they were questioning about it, being nervous about it because they were afraid they want to sacrifice any more hearing of what they have left, which I understand or fears. Oh, 100%. But it's great that you could be such a role model for people. Um, I, I love that. So if you had, you know, different organizations or resources that you could recommend to people, like someone who's watching this who might be considering getting a cochlear implant, what would you advise them to do? And, and how would they learn more about the process? Well, I would say uh, don't wait. I mean, don't wait to the point that that you're in desperation because, you know, there's a website called checkmyhearingaid.com. And I think anybody that has a hearing loss and they feel that they're going to lose more of their hearing, then uh, jump on the bandwagon and get involved with the cochlear implant to find out you could be a candidate because, you know, you're losing valuable time. Like myself, I wish I had, I could have done this uh, 10 years ago. Okay. But, uh, but, you know, it, it's just that 
now I understand what we're going through it because before I was kind of nervous about it because I was told years ago, they say to me, once you have a cochlear implant, it destroys the canal. You can never go back to a hearing aid again. That scared the hell out of me. Mm-hmm. Because I say, what if the surgery doesn't work? I can never go back to a hearing aid. So a lot of people have to fear. But today with technology and the fact that they do a, a extensive tests, hearing tests, like the water tests, and you qualify as a candidate, then you have like a 99% success rate. That's great. Well, and I think usually they just do one at one side at a time as well. So God forbid, you know, something is really doesn't go well. At least you sort of have that other side remaining. Yeah, I did my worst, the worst, my worst uh, side. Right, right. So tell me what's new uh, for you in terms of your acting career. Do you have something exciting coming up on the horizon? What's your latest project? Well, I'm filming a horror movie in Syracuse in August. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, I've never been involved in the horror space before because I was going to film like Frankenstein, like Dracula, but something had to, had to substantial, I mean, effect on people. So that's why I'm going to be it because I'm going to have long hair, have a beard, and I'm kind of like playing a treacherous character like a Hannibal Lecter in the woods. Ooh. Yeah, and it got and uh, you know, and it, it got a great plot. So they just they, they just announced in a can friend. But that's something that I'm looking forward to because I like to play different characters. But the nice thing is the fact that in Hollywood now, over the years that you have people that played part of hearing character, normal people play deaf characters, but it's changed now because like Marlon Mack and there's different other actresses, actors they can't be able to play these different characters. Like myself now, like for example, uh, before I did the, uh, the movie or uh, the TV series, The Offer, we all had to get together on the computer, all 60, 70 actors. And they had explained that because of diversity now, you can't make any uh, comment about race, nothing about handicap, nothing about speech, nothing about everything else. And more respectable. That's why when I was on the set filming the, the, the TV series The Offer, I talked openly about the implant because at the time, everybody on the set were wearing a mask. And I would say, hey, listen, your voice being muffled, please pull down your mask. They had to because the fact that, you know, being respected as a diversity, but it was such a wonderful experience because I was hearing so many different sounds, hear different conversation, able to hear the dialogue better, then constantly have to stare the person in the face and wait till they finish the last word and me to deliver my uh, sentence. Right, right. Well, this is great. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see that. <laughs> Horror movies always scare me, but this one sounds like it'll I be- I like this one. You have to close your eyes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, that's great. So um, I see that we are getting close to time. I don't know if you have any other final thoughts that you want to share with the, the viewers today about your cochlear implant or anything about your hearing loss. I would say if anybody's thinking about it, just go for it because now they have it down like a sinus because they've been around for over 50 years. But now with the development and the beauty about the cochlear implant, you can almost be your own audiologist now with the iPhone because you can monitor like the bass and the treble and the, and the sound. And also you could also now with the sound and a direct conversation or direct on one person or on a wide uh, broadband base. And also the nice thing about it is the fact that even now, sometimes I just practice my cochlear. I use the app to listen to conversation. They have an app that you listen to different conversation and they ask you three, they ask you three different questions related to the conversation, like yes or no answers. And that's a great uh, uh, remedy, for, especially for, for the cochlear implant to keep uh, tuning in. But it's funny, when I first started from the beginning, I heard bell and, and, and uh, ringing sound. But now I got to the point where it's discrimination. It's, it's, it's gone from like, I would say maybe 21% I'm up to probably at the 80 percent. This is the bad ear alone. That's just the left ear. I think with the second implant, that probably would be, be, uh, be probably take to the next level. Probably hear better I ever heard in my whole life. Wow, that's. I mean, that alone is a life changing uh, improvement. So that's fabulous. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me. This was a terrific discussion. I learned a lot. And I think people are really going to appreciate learning about your experiences and really be inspired to check out and learn more about cochlear implants. So I wish you lots of continued success in your hearing loss journey. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. My pleasure.